But let's talk about causality. The term causality refers to cause and effect. In our everyday understanding of cause and effect, we presuppose the concept of passage of time. If one incident would cause another, then time must surely have passed between event A, the cause, and event B, the effect. And if no time has passed between events A and B, then one could hardly allege that A has caused B. Which one has caused which one? Was A first or B first? We don't know because they all happen simultaneously. Since no passage of time exists within each of the above mentioned universes as elements of four dimensions, one could hardly speak of cause and effect. There's nothing that causes anything else as we would generally understand it. Everything happens at once. But someone might say, if no passage of time ha takes place, then it's impossible for anything to happen since events take up time. That's our understanding in three dimensions of events. So let's do another thought experiment. That costs nothing. The cosmic painter. Take, for instance, an earthbound painter who can paint an artwork in exactly 10 hours. If we could accelerate the Earth's speed sufficiently, so time would decelerate sufficiently for its rate to halve that our fear, then the same painter could do his art in five hours. Do you agree? Because as we speed up the Earth, time slows down. If we could speed up the Earth sufficiently, time could halve. And this guy would complete his picture in five hours. If we could increase the Earth's speed even more so that time would pass at a quarter of its normal rate, then the same painter could do his art in two and a half hours. And if we could speed up the Earth so much that time comes to a standstill, which would be physically impossible, we've been there last night, then the painter, maybe his spirit, would be able to do his art in exactly zero seconds. <laughs> Do you agree that you can paint a painting in zero seconds? <laughs> Such a painter would move at the speed of light. Theoretically, he would burst into the fourth dimension where time would stand still. Now, some event has definitely transpired. A painter has completed an artwork, but no time has passed. He has finished his work without any time passing between his setting up and his signature. Amazing. We're not used to this kind of thing. <laughs> Although an observer in a stationary frame of reference would definitely observe passage of time, light moves at an incredibly fast but finite 299000 kilometer per second, the painter himself would observe time to stand still. So it's a matter of perception, it's a matter of where you stand at looking at it. And that's why uh, Einstein called this theory the theory of relativity. Passage of time, as we know it, does not exist in the fourth dimension. Time stands still, although events happen. And whenever time stands still, there is eternity. Eternity is not time transpiring endlessly. Eternity is time standing still. That's how it's going to be in heaven. Time stands still, and you're going to have in an eternity to speak to Jesus. Wouldn't that be wonderful? The collective human memory has absolutely no recollection of a time before Homo sapiens. No document, mythology, or even oral lore exists in the collective human memory that would even hint at a time before Homo sapiens. The most ancient history we know, for example, those from the Sumerian clay tablets, speaks of a foretime, at the start of which humanity had already been a developed people. From a biblical perspective, this foretime simply falls into the time period between the fall and Noah's flood. That's the foretime. Simply no human memory exists of a time when man used to be a hominin, a Neanderthal, or Denisovian. The question is, why not? Why can't we remember that? 
since we do realize that the paleontological record concerning this is a glaring reality that these guys can take out and show. But geology, paleontology and the fossil record all seem to tell a story that's been eradicated from the collective human memory by time. Or maybe not. And this is our new model, which we will propose for you. And I thought it out, so uh, I can give it the name. You can call it the model of dimensional decay. A guy by the name of Oliver Wendell Holmes said the following, Every now and then, a man's mind is stretched by a new idea or sensation and never shrinks back to its former dimensions. I've been stretching your minds since last <laughs> night and I hope they will never shrink back to its former dimensions again. You will never think the same ever again. If you would hereafter regard our suggested model to be far-fetched, you still don't know what it is. We haven't proposed it yet. Here's good advice. Restrain your laughter so you won't render yourself to be an object of scorn. During an interview on BBC Radio in the 1970s, a British astronomer, Fred Hoyle, mockingly used the term Big Bang to scoff at the then new model of the origin of the universe. They were having an interview with him on BBC Radio and this whole model that is very well known today was then still very new and it didn't have a name and Fred Hoyle said he was against it. He, he said this is a lot of nonsense and he scoffed it and he said what are these people who say this big bang happened? And then the term stuck <laughs> in the vernacular. <laughs> and uh, after the interview the term established itself in the scientific vernacular since it was so descriptive. Hence Hoyle sat with egg on his face since the 1970s until his death in 2001. So don't scoff too fast. And this, this is what we propose. This is our new theory. So please focus. Our three-dimensional universe that we know and love had its origin when? At the fall. By the Sonderfall. What happened then? When one of the previously non-material four-dimensional universes was reduced and materialized into just three dimensions. What are we saying? Before the fall, we didn't live in three dimensions. We lived in four. It was a spiritual world where Adam and Eve walked with God, talked with God, and could see Him and hear Him. A spiritual world. At the fall, all of that changed. And that universe of which Eden was part, which was a three-dimensional universe, one of many in a four-dimensional space, was then reduced to just three where we are today. That's where we are trapped today. We materialize from spirit into matter for the first time. Because matter can only exist, as we said, in three dimensions. That would mean that for our universe, which is a single one from an infinite number of candidates, the fourth dimension spatial time axis was reduced to zero and that everything contained in it was compressed into three dimensions while those three dimensions would apparently move unstoppably through the fourth dimension that is time at 24 hours per day. Unstoppable. Do you realize what we are saying? Look at me. 
time had a beginning. Time started at the fall. Before the fall, there was no time. Time is undefined in that space. Because everything stands still. Time stands still. So you, it's, it's a stupid question to ask, how old was Adam when the fall happened? Adam hadn't experienced any time in the Garden of Eden. There was no passage of time. Everything happened simultaneously. <laughs> time stood still. And the clock only started to tick at the fall. When everything compressed and condensed into matter. So, what are we saying? We are saying that Adam, when he was created, didn't have a physical body. What God created for him was a spiritual body in which he brew his nashima to make it alive. And this afternoon we'll be talking a lot about that. How that happened. During this process, almost everything that originally used to be non-material was materialized into matter. This happened only for our universe. We have no idea whether the same happened to the rest of the fourth dimension, which has an infinite number of such candidates. Perhaps an infinite number of similar universes like ours exist that we don't know about. Or maybe the rest of the fourth dimension simply remained the way it had been before, because no sin ever happened there. We don't know if there are people who could sin. At this materialization, which probably included a Big Bang, the cosmic earth clock for the first time started to tick. This for us was the beginning of time, and since then it has ticked through almost 6,000 years. So what are we really saying? We are saying that no concept of time existed before 6,000 years ago. And hence, that it would be undefined to speak of, for example, a time before the fall which would amount to linear backwards extrapolation of the rate of the passage of time. So what are we saying? We are saying that time didn't always pass at 24 hours per day. That's what we're saying. If we say that, then we are extrapolating backwards. We are guessing. We can't say that it was so because there was nobody to take readings or, or look or watch. This wouldn't mean that our universe's past spans a mere 6,000 years of history. If we would say that, we would say the same as the creationists do. What do the creationists say? They say that everything was created 6,000 years ago. We're not saying that. We say that there was an infinite space in which anything could happen all at once for a very long time, if you want. Not that that time exists. It all happened at once. But Earth wasn't created that, that, at that stage. The Earth came into time, developed. It developed before the fall. At this point, we'll have to change our terminology. Yes, our past does span a mere 6,000 years of history in passage of time years. But there is much more to our past than mere passage of time. Before the 6,000 years started, a vast number of events all at once occurred in the then fourth dimension. And we can illustrate it thus. Instead of the Big Bang lying here, the Big Bang lies there. And the Big Bang, look at me quickly, and the Big Bang and the Fall happened at exactly the same point in time. Hmm. There was no passage of time in between. Hmm. 
everything happened on the blue disk in time. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in time, the Big Bang and the Fall lie at the very same point. And that's the time differences. It's of course not on scale. Because that last slice of the trumpet is a very, very thin slice. <laughs> very, very thin. It's, it's just 6,000 years against 13.8 billion years. Our model therefore says that in real time we have only the following true data points where there was somebody who could look. That's all we got. Because that's when there were humans. To look. <laughs> all the, of the rest had been extrapolated. And that's just 6,000 years. Hence, this model also provides for the yet unproven but essential concept of inflation, which would facilitate the universe's current size. We're not going to talk about that. I just put that in for scientists that might watch the video. It's a rather new theory, the theory of inflation. In this process, we get rid of that troublesome singularity, as well as the unnecessary speculative reverse extrapolation of dataless billions of years. We just drop it. Isn't it nice <laughs> to get rid of all the billions and millions of years? We hereby then steal 99.9997% of the existing Big Bang model's time. And perhaps we shouldn't then speak of a young Earth like creationists, but rather of a developed Earth. That's what came into time. Not a young earth, but a developed earth. The implications of this for our concept of time. On earth, at earth speed, time transpires immutably at 24 hours per day, no slower and no quicker. In order to have time pass slower, we'll have to make the earth run around the sun much quicker, so that time can slow down. In order to have time pass quicker, we'll have to make the Earth run much slower relatively to the center of our solar system, the Milky Way, as well as to the center of the current universe. Any observant scientist would now ask, so where did the energy come from to facilitate this reduction or materialization from four to three dimensions? Where did that energy come from? My answer for that is, well, we'll answer those scientists as soon as they can explain to us where the energy for the Big Bang came from and why this super dense singularity did not decay into a black hole. It's actually a very simple answer. I can give that straight away. In order for us from three dimensions to go to four dimensions, we need immense amounts of energy. Just to come near to it, we'll never get there. But we need immense amounts of energy just to get near to it. In other words, the fourth dimension represents much, much, much more energy than three dimensions. So if four dimensions decay into three dimensions, there's lots of energy available to do just that. The truth is nobody knows except believers. And this belief by definition cannot be scientifically proven since as soon as any belief gets proven, it's faith no more, but fact. The folly of applying a three-dimensional concept of passage of time to the pre-fall universe. This conceptual framework renders speaking of the time before the fall meaningless. There was no time before the fall, that is passage of time. It was an incorporeal, in terms of matter as we know it, universe in which time stood still. The question how much time had transpired between creation and the fall therefore becomes undefined and meaningless. Even so, the 13.8 billion years of the Big Bang Theory. Time as we know it, according to this model, had started with the fall, when the clock proverbially started ticking. To extrapolate time backwards as from this point would become a meaningless, dataless, speculative exercise. 
We can only say what has materialized from the fourth dimension. Abundant data for this emanates from geology and paleontology, but it would be utterly meaningless to pretend that we know exactly why things had occurred, because there were no causality, remember? So we don't know what caused what, or when they had happened, there was no passage of time. Apparent passage of time and apparent causality observed in current ancient materialized matter would be a mere function of dimensional decay or compression. It would benefit and power science immensely if mathematical models for such a decay and causality could be developed. What is the problem there? Example reasons why current instruments of and methods of dating becomes meaningless within this frame of reference because we carbon date, carbon 14 date these things and we say they happened or lived so many years ago. What is carbon 14? What is our instrument of determining that? It's a sample of carbon and isotope. Normal carbon is carbon 12, carbon 14 is a very rare isotope of carbon. It's a very small percentage of the carbon that we find in nature. This has gone through this process as well. That carbon-14 also formed 6,000 years ago when four dimensions turned into three. So our very instrument was subject to the same process. What was it that originally existed in the fourth dimension, which then materialized into a hominin skeleton in a rising star cave? That's what we need to ask now. Or, what would happen to the half-life of carbon-14 radioactive decay when an abstract atom of this carbon isotope inorganic material, in inverted commas, would suddenly decay from the fourth dimension into matter. Science is simply clueless. We have no idea in science what would happen. Just to explain that equation quickly. C stands for carbon. There's a 14 and there's a 6. What does this indicate? The 6 is its atomic number. That's the number of protons in its nucleus. That determines that it is carbon. An, an element is known by the number of protons in its nuclear. The 14 is its mass number, not its atomic number, its mass number. The mass number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons in its nucleus. So there are 14 protons and neutrons. We know that the protons are 6, so the neutrons must be 14 minus 6, which is 8. It has 8 neutrons in its nucleus. When such an atom would decay radioactively, what does it do? It turns into nitrogen, N. It's a, a different element with an atomic number of 7. It has 7 protons in its nucleus and its mass number now stays 14. And there's a beta part that goes out from it. So what has happened? One of the carbon's neutrons turned into a proton plus a beta particle, which is an electron. That's what happened. And that beta particle that shoots out, that's what you measure with a Geiger counter as radioactive energy. Right. And the rate at which they come from a sample then gives us the age of the sample. If our new model would hold water, the truth is simply that our very dating instruments would have been subject to such decay. What are the advantages of this new model? The model sidesteps several well-known physics and theological problems, the ones that we talked about last night. It sidesteps all of them. In physics, the model gets rid of that annoying singularity, unavoidably implied by the classical Big Bang Theory. A singularity is not an inevitability anymore. A new event horizon is created at the fall. Whenever we attempt to glance back at the past beyond the fall, we erroneously observe things the way they currently are in three dimensions and not the way they used to be in four dimensions. The new model in future mathematical models might even cast light on the yet unproven theory of universal inflation soon after the Big Bang 
that's the part that you don't have to worry about, that's for the scientists. Theology. The new model gets rid of the unbiblical, naive, simplistic 6 times 24 hour day creation narrative. The new model gets rid of the age of the universe and age of the earth problems and synchronizes scientific observations with biblical history. The new model gets rid of the pre-fall causality. For instance, we needn't ask anymore why there used to be evolutionary death, trauma and illness before the fall, before sin. Because everything happened at once and nothing caused something else. After the break, I've had quite a number of questions. We're all on a journey and we're all searching for solutions. The solution that we're searching for is a reconciliation between biblical truth and scientific truth. And we need to reconcile those two because they originate from the same source, which is God. Go with me on this journey and weigh the evidence that I give you. That, that, and as I said before, test it, weigh it, criticize it, try and find the, the mistakes or whatever flaws there might be, so that we can get to the truth. I don't want to be right. I want the truth. <laughs> That's what I want. Okay. The notorious aversion that scientists have towards cataclysms. Scientists, especially geologists, paleontologists, and biologists, simply loathe the idea of a cataclysm. Now, what is a cataclysm? A cataclysm being a drastic, intrusive event which redirects the course of scientific world history onto a completely new track. Something like, for instance, Noah's Flood. Noah's Flood changed everything. In their world, a cataclysm represents a point of discontinuity on the otherwise even graph of the passage of time traversing universal history. In other words, in the minds of scientists, the graph of history is an even graph like that. It has rises and it has falls, it has bumps and this, uh, it has its valleys. But it's not like this. It's not sharp peaks. Right? In mathematics, we call such a sharp peak or a sharp point here at the bottom, we call it a point of discontinuity. It's a point that, that represents a drastic change in the course of events. And scientists say that that's not how nature operates. Nature operates like this. So, when any theory would propose a point of discontinuity, a point of cataclysm, scientists are very reluctant to, to accept it, for this very reason. What our new model suggests here represents a cataclysmic intrusion in the universal history at the point of the fall. Apart from any other considerations, the scientific world wouldn't have much affinity for the new model, simply for its cataclysmic nature. The irony of this is that the entire scientific world is currently sold out to the cataclysmic Big Bang Theory. So if the Big Bang cataclysm were to be acceptable, why not this dimensional decay cataclysm? That's my question. We are convinced that this model offers an elegant solution to the well-known time discrepancy between accepted astrophysics and the collective human memory. Now we are at the point of discontinuity. We're changing the course of the lecture. Now you don't have to think so much anymore. It's easier stuff that we're going to go over. Atheism represents a contradiction in terms. We need to talk about this because this is where many, many scientists are, because of what they do. They say there's no God, it, everything just happened by chance, it was just a process of science. That is a very important sentence, that green one. Atheists believe that God doesn't exist. Mm. Mm. Why do they believe it? Because you can't prove it. The important thing is, atheists also believe. In my mind, actually thinking it over, I think it is impossible to have a situation of what we would call a religion. A religion. No religion. I think it's impossible for a person to be a religious. As soon as you become 
a religious, you become religious again to the other side. But you can't escape religion. I think it's impossible. But the denial of the existence of supernatural phenomena and the Godhead is simply illogical, untrue, dishonest, and somewhat stupid notion. Why stupid? Since atheism strives to avoid the issue of unprovable faith that God exists at all costs. Therefore, the majority of contemporary atheists proclaim that they would only believe whatever can be proven scientifically. Therefore, they don't believe in the supernatural which cannot be proven scientifically. But, ironically, this unbelief actually amounts to inverted faith. Why? Because atheists have unproven faith that the supernatural does not exist. And it's a faith, because you can't prove it. That the supernatural does not exist has never been and cannot be proven scientifically. Atheists therefore believe, unproven, that the supernatural does not exist. This a religious choice of atheists is therefore a contradiction in terms. Their stated unbelief in God due to a lack of scientific proof really amounts to faith due to a similar lack of scientific proof that God and the supernatural does not exist. Hello, Albert Camus, Richard Dawkins, Ludwig Feuerbach, Bertrand Russell and company. Who were they? They were the very loud atheists of the past. Dawkins is still alive. And since atheism is a contradiction in terms, it is meaningless and dishonest and hence somewhat stupid. The counter-argument. Atheist scientists have a counter-argument to this. Well, they say, we also don't believe in the existence of the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Mouth, or Santa Claus. We cannot prove that they don't exist, but we don't believe in them. Do Christians believe in them? This, likewise, is a dishonest argument. It's rather easy to prove that the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Mouth, and Santa Claus don't exist. Well, how do you go about it? Whenever the effects caused by these three characters in the world would be confined to controlled laboratory conditions, the adults who cause these effects would get caught out very easily. As soon as the human factor gets removed from the system, the effects disappear. The same is not true about God. Scientists have never been able to create a closed system that eliminates God. That's what you do in experiments, you create a closed system. The continued existence of these three characters is dependent on imitation of their characters by adults in order to amuse children. Their existence and continued existence are therefore dependent on a social agreement where adults agree to maintain this recognized lie. God's existence and continued existence are completely independent from human behavior. Countless recorded instances exist even since antiquity unto today where God intervened into the lives of people who didn't know them or even wanted to know them. But we do consider the fact that absence of evidence does not indicate evidence of absence. And we have to apply it here as well. So we can't just say because we don't have evidence that these three exist, therefore they are absent. This is so, yes. But if anybody would then insist that these three characters do exist, then they hardly exert any influence in the world because whenever we put them under laboratory conditions, the effects disappear. And it would be rather silly to believe in anything such. And have science atheists ever honestly calculated the probability of God's existence, who has given us a Bible of 66 books, written and compiled by different authors over thousands of years in different parts of the world, but nevertheless display an almost perfect coherence. Or why hundreds of biblical prophecies became true later on. Or why millions of people from different nations and tongues worldwide testify that they have a personal relationship with the risen Jesus Christ by faith and the Holy Spirit. Or why those same millions of people testify that this Jesus has irreversibly turned around their lives for the good. What is the probability that all those millions of people are hallucinating? An example. Mathematically, the six days of creation and day of rest can be listed in so many different sequences. 
7 faculty is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times 5 times 6 times 7. If you work that out, it amounts to 5040. That's the number of sequences by which you can write the days of the week. Different ways that you can permutate them. It's called permutations. So that's the 5040 ways in which you can do it. What would be the probability that the author of Genesis would randomly hit on the single incredible correlation of this order of creation with that of science 6,000 years later? That was done with Flux Quidlet, they did recreate. Why do atheists find it acceptable that from the beginning there was something, but not someone? Why do atheists regard faith in an original something acceptable, the Big Bang, but faith in an original someone unacceptable? Why do many atheists believe in the existence of dark energy and dark matter, which we cannot detect in any perceivable way, these are simply the outcome of mathematical probabilities, but they refuse to believe in the existence of God based on similar mathematical probabilities? The atheist view remains meaningless, dishonest, and rather foolish. So let's have a hard look at creationism as well. Creationism might have been a sincere, but hopelessly unscientific alternative to the Big Bang. Despite an absolute excess of evidence to the contrary, from almost every conceivable scientific discipline, for example cosmology, astronomy, theoretical physics, paleontology, geology, zoology, botany, physiology, and many more, creationists stubbornly insist that the creation took place in 6 times 24 hour days. In an attempt to maintain the integrity of their naive interpretation of the biblical tale of creation, they collect mutually disconnected examples from nature which, according to them, prove the earth to be a mere 6,000 years old as well as its six-day creation in magic wand fashion. I call the god of creationists a Harry Potter god. They want to believe that God created the world in a magic wand fashion. There's the earth, there's the sky, there's the animals, there's the plants, and every time he swings his wand and it just whoosh, happens. The pictures I portrayed there for you at the bottom of the slide are depictions, ancient depictions, of Jesus doing his miracles with a magic wand. On the left he raises Lazarus from the death, and at the right he is increasing the fishes and the loaves. So mankind has been thinking about Jesus and about God in magic wand fashion for many, many years. And it's time to stop that now. <laughs> God doesn't work that way. What is the difference between a brick wall and a heap of bricks? Oxygen structure. Order. A wall a brick wall is ordered bricks, a heap of bricks or a pile of bricks is disordered bricks. The evidence and the knowledge pool of creationism is a heap of bricks. Disorderly, there's no relationship between the bricks, there's no order between them, there's no wall. Whatever evidence they can find that might indicate that the earth is just 6,000 years old, they pile on the heap. Another brick? Oh, so we don't. There's no model. There's no order between the, They don't relate to one another. It's just a pile of bricks. That's the knowledge pool of creationism. Let's have a look at it. There's a very significant cartoon. On the left hand side, it says the scientific method. What is the scientific method? What is it like? That scientist with his experiments there, he says, here are the facts. What conclusions can we draw from them? That's the way science works. 
on the right hand side the creationist method that guy says here's the conclusion what facts can we find to support it deeply deeply unscientific you can't work that way in science the evidence leads to a conclusion in creationism the conclusion has long been made and now they're doing experiments to prove the conclusion science doesn't work that way deeply deeply unscientific this approach is deeply unscientific honest science goes with its conclusions wherever experimental evidence might lead. In other words, honest science does its experiments first and thereafter draws its conclusions on the grounds of these. Honest science holds no favorites and may never decide in advance what its outcomes should be. This honest creationism literally turns this process on its head. Its evidence goes wherever its conclusions might have led. In other words, it first draws its conclusion and thereafter collects supporting evidence for its conclusion and conveniently ignores all experimental evidence contradicting its conclusions. That is, creationism has a favorite. Its interpretation of the biblical creation story. That's the favorite. That's it, total, total kai. And exactly that happens to be its predetermined outcome. Moreover, creationists demonize the Big Bang model, spitefully gloating over the millions of years of Earth history that emanates from it. Have you heard that in church? And demonize any dissenting Christian with labels of being unbiblical and heretic. I've been labeled that way many, many times myself. Because creationists has the audacity to present their theory as the official Christian viewpoint. Because that is in the Bible. No, that's not in the Bible. As we've seen last night. <laughs> and if you say anything else, then you're unbiblical according to them. And her heretic. In South Africa today, creationist propaganda has been so successful in the church environment that most Christians believe that the creationism viewpoint represents the official and proper Christian position. The South African Christian and homeschooling systems curricula, for example, are riddled with this dishonest, unscientific, false propaganda presented as the official Christian dogma. It has already poisoned a whole generation of Christian children. And if those children sit in a lecture like this, they are very, very confused afterwards. Because then they realize I've been fed a lot of lies. In the majority of cases, Creation Ministries International, they sit in Durban, sits behind this propaganda. Or the American Kent Hoban, or Dr. Dino as he calls himself, also played a lesser role. For decades already, Creation Ministries International has parasitized on the well-known ignorance of regular Christians regarding the complexities of our world as explained in this lecture. Moreover, it makes no effort to educate Christians in this regard since it knows that the elimination of ignorance would hurt its agenda. After more than 30 years in so-called ministry, Creation Ministries still doesn't offer any credible scientific model and continues to pile loose bricks of evidence onto a huge unrelated heap. Subscribe to their newsletter. Every newsletter puts another brick or two on the heap. Let's say this once and for all. Creationists blissfully and cluelessly entertain the solution and smugly pat themselves on the back for that, believing that they defend God, the Bible and creation. Having been blinded by their own ideology, they don't realize that literally all they are really defending is a translation option. The translation of the Hebrew word asa with make instead of reveal. That's all they're defending. Following the fool Don Quixote, 
their fight is really against the windmills of their own minds. Herbert Spencer has said, the ultimate result of shielding men from the effects of folly is to fill the world with fools. And I'm afraid we have filled the worlds with a whole generation of Christian fools already by this nonsense. Creationists, like all Christian dogmatics, also systemically display serious symptoms of bibliolatry, elevation of the scriptures unto idol status. It's rife in South Africa. In other words, they have believed everything the Templar Masonic leaders of the Reformation, all four of those were Templars, and their successors have taught them regarding the scriptures. For example, the extra-biblical concepts of infallibility, authority, inspiration, sufficiency, etc. of the scriptures. None of those you can find in the scriptures. Everything we believe about the scriptures is not in the scriptures. We get it from somewhere else. We get it from the minds of theologians. That's where we get it from, not from scripture. Whenever Bible readers would find that experimental factual results contradict their interpretation of Scripture and would then persistently opt to maintain their interpretation of Scripture, this would represent serious symptoms of bibliolatry. Mm. This would imply that at primary level they believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. Mm. And that, I'm afraid, is idolatry. Creationists naively believe they defend the scriptures. This smokescreen is far from the truth. Creationists simply defend their naive interpretation of the scriptures. To the Templar Masonic leaders of the Reformation, Luther, Calvin, Twingley and Knox, the scriptures were simply a means of dethroning the Pope as a part of a broader Templar agenda of revenge against the RCC, the Roman Catholic Church, the French monarchy and Islam. I explain everything on my uh, Freemasonry DVDs. I'm not going to explain here again. It's a whole history that sits behind it. Creationism is a dishonest, deceiving and dangerous doctrine. It keeps Christianity and the kingdom in ignorance and simplistic gullibility. It is based in Templar Masonic theology and robs God of the honor is due for revealing his omnipotence in the amazing complexities of his creation. God is the creator, and for centuries now, science has been toiling away to simply fathom what he had done and how he had done it. That's the job of science. What happened at the fall? And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. That was the reason why Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. God didn't want them to get hold of the fruit of the tree of life and eat it. Why not? God doesn't say it in the Bible, but I think it's quite clear. Say? It would be a permanent state of um, many sown there with the sin. That if they eat from the tree of life, what would happen to them? They would live forever in their state of sin. And God would be unable to save them. God had a plan of salvation for mankind as soon as the sin happened. Because he knew it's going to happen. And he had his plan ready. And if man would eat the tree of life, he would continue in his state of sin forever. So that's why he was banished. That's why four dimensions had to become free to get us out of the fourth dimension so we can't go back we can't go fast enough to get there <laughs> so the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken after he drove the man out he placed at the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life Although the entire pre-fall history in Scripture gets narrated against the backdrop of passage of time, it seems to have played out in a specific geographical place, that is the Garden of Eden. One could therefore assume that in our model, everything has taken place 
within one three-dimensional space at a specific point on this four-dimensional time axis. In other words, everything occurred simultaneously but gets told against the backdrop of a passage of time to render it fathomable for three-dimensional mortals like us. Summary. So what are we really saying? And now we're going to land. The scientific method is supposed to be a systematic process. Every new conclusion builds on previous ones. This method has proved itself extremely successful on countless occasions, currently resulting in huge worldwide trust in this process, provided that it gets applied honestly and responsibly. The disadvantage of this method is that if errors would occur in today's results, tomorrow's conclusions would build on top of lies, which would ultimately compromise the truth. And that's what we don't want. The symptoms of such lies are usually detected by means of logical contradictions during the outcomes of experiments. The discoveries of such errors then likely cause all the conclusions that succeeded these errors to be erroneous and to be reconsidered and redesigned. We therefore argue that the dataless backwards extrapolation of time of the traditional Big Bang model in universal history represents exactly such an error, an error manifesting amongst others in the logical contradiction between the time concepts of the collective human memory and the traditional Big Bang model. We therefore argue that the dating of everything on Earth older than plus minus 6,000 years is currently based on an erroneous rectilinear backwards extrapolation of time, because that's what we did. Also, that every such dating method and technology is based in an erroneous rectilinear backwards extrapolation of time. In other words, we argue that every such dating should be reconsidered. We argue that creation has resulted in a multidimensional universe, maybe 11 dimensions. At a certain point on the time-space axis of that multidimensional universe, there used to be a spiritual Eden as part of a four-dimensional space, where the well-known paradise events took place and where the first spiritual Homo sapiens could see and hear God and walk with Him. This Eden as well as the created universe around it at a certain point on the time-space axis, plus minus 6,000 years ago materialized into three dimensions and matter as a result of sin. These are some of the oldest true data points available, because they were meant to see and not. And the rest of the story which unfolded as time passed, we know all too well. It is our very and only history. So, hopefully now we have a model to understand where we come from. Next question, where are we going? We live, as we've said, in a flat universe, where everything in our Goldilocks environment will go happy-go-lucky for many, many years to come. How many? Can we once again extrapolate time forwards and say that everything will forever go the way it goes today? It is also possible that at the end of time when the clock stops ticking, the inverse of what we postulate here could happen. For example, a dimensional increment of our universe from three dimensions into four dimensions once again, so that we go back to where we originally came from. If so, we needn't wait for a closed, flat or open universe scenario to unfold. Long before any such scenarios would occur, such a dimensional increment might have the biblical eschatological events unfold against a time scale that has no connection to a daily 24-hour day pattern. That's the end. And this afternoon we'll be looking at what's ahead. 
What we're saying is that it is quite possible that at the end of time, when God so decides when Jesus returns, we will not be reduced to three dimensions as happened before. We will be incremented once again to four dimensions. And going back at the restoration of the Garden of Eden, where we originally came from. Wouldn't that be a good day? The day of eternity, when where time will once again stand still, and we will be forever and ever without the bell ringing anywhere for the end of a period. <laughs> with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit on the streets of God. Let's close our eyes. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you for revealing in the scriptures where we're going. Thank you that you have revealed to us and that you have done the very hard job of saving us so that we can be on the winning side in the end. Thank you that we can look forward to a day when you will come and fetch us to be with you eternally where we will be able to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. We pray that your kingdom will advance. We pray that many more sheep, many more tons of harvest will come into the fold long before that. And we pray for the workers of the harvest, that you will provide them and raise them up in our time, so that you can come back, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.